Welcome, this is module five of the course called Coding for Crosswords. In this module, we will introduce the concept of vectors, how to work with things in groups. So in module three, we had a simple program that added one plus one. And in module four, we introduced the basic concept of a string, how to assign letters, sequence of letters to a variable. In this module, we're going to go back to the problem that we're trying to solve, which was introduced in module one. And that problem looks like this. It's this crossword puzzle that we want to encode in our program. So the first task is to figure out how do we represent this information that's in this picture in a program. And we're going to use, as you could guess, a string variable to do it. So here's what we do. Let's go to our coding window and let's bring up the code from last time, which looks something like this. We had the include files just to get ourselves going to be able to print and use the string. Then we have a main function. And then we can assign some strings, some characters to a string. And then we can print it. So now what we want to do is change this. Let's maybe maybe call it S0 because we're going to have a number of them, one for each line. And we're going to call this, maybe we're going to call this dog. And then for those black squares, there's already a convention used by the crossword puzzle software that you can find on the internet where these are dots. So we'll use that same convention. So dot, 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 dot. So that's the first line of our crossword puzzle. And we're gonna repeat that a bunch of times, okay? So three, four, five, six, seven. So we're gonna do this seven times. And each line is going to have the representation of that line in the puzzle. Now, what's this line? Now, we have three blanks. Now, a blank we can show with a dash. That means we don't know yet what the letter is going to be there. Um, but we're going to hold it with a blank. So the computer program, we hope later, will be able to fill this in. Let's finish the grid, and then I'll show you what I mean. So this is the rest of the grid, and you should go ahead and follow along with this in your own code. Now, down here, it's going to be cat. So this is the grid that we want to solve. Now we're hoping that eventually, not in this module, but in later modules, we will have the computer look in a dictionary, find words, and write them in here. So it will say, it'll, for instance, it'll say draw. So the computer program ultimately will be creating, constructing a crossword puzzle that has valid words in all of these horizontal and vertical entries. So that's our goal. So first of all, will this compile? So this is your first challenge, is type this in on your own uh, system and see if it will compile, okay? And let's fix that error so it's a variable that's been declared. And let's try to print all of them out again. Okay, did it compile? And if you typed it in just like I did, the answer is going to be no, because um, we did not quote this string. It thinks there's a variable called dog, and it gets confused by that. So what we need to do is quote these, quote them, and terminate them with a semicolon. Okay, so will this compile now? And my guess is I think it will. And when we run it, it prints the grid. So there we go. So we're one step of the way, but this is kind of a pain, right? To work with these S1s and S2s, if we were to write some code that would do something to any of these, we'd have to repeat that code for every line separately in the file, and that's never gonna work. So as you probably guessed, the vector is gonna be our answer for this. So vector is another STL component that's a key part of C++, and to see how to use it, let's go back to the browser window, okay? So again, you can type in pretty much anything, just like for the string case, you can type in vector C++ or C++ vector. Um, and we'll go again to the C++.com website and we'll look at this. And here it is, vectors are sequence containers representing arrays that can change in size. So that's a lot of words. It basically means it holds a bunch of stuff. And, um, before we get to what it actually offers us, let's go back to the coding window and let's say, what, what would we like? What's ideally, what's the thing that we want to have happen? 
let's think about this. We'd like to have a thing. So it's going to be a, a new variable of type thing. And it's going to be called, let's call it a grid. It'll consist of all of these lines in the grid. So first of all, that's, that's going to be the, th the thing we want. Like, and it's very much like an X, you know. So we used to have like integer X or string, you know, F. Instead, it's going to be some kind of a thing, grid. And what we'd like is to say grid add, you know, all of this information here, right? We'd like it to add this as an argument. So we're saying, hey, grid, please add this to all the other stuff you have. Keep what you have before, but add this extra stuff. Okay, so we're going to possibly have this now for every one of these lines in the file. Sorry, lines in the, uh, in the input grid. So this won't compile as it is because it doesn't know what thing is, but I'm trying to show you what we want uh, the behavior to be. Um, so now let's go back to see what the vector actually does. And if we scroll down here, um, past some of the iterator stuff, which is a little complicated, we'll get to that later. Um, you will see um, element access and modifiers. And this one here is the one we want called push back. Now it's kind of a funny name, but it means add to the end of the vector. So let me show you here a little drawing of what that means. Um, think of the vector like a train car. It starts empty. And I mean, the vector is the whole train. And as you push back, you're adding a car to the train. And this car can be anything. In our case, we've defined the vector to be a vector of string. We want it to be a type string. So every car we add is going to be a new string. And this is the back of the train right here, this part. So when we push back, we're adding a new car to the train. And we're going to add seven cars to the train. So instead of this add that we've written here, we're going to instead do push back. All right, so we didn't change that. So that's the actual uh, syntax for how you add something to a vector. And then it's not called thing, right? It's going to be called vector. But specifically, it's not just any vector. It's a vector of strings. We don't want a vector of ints. We don't want a vector of floats. We don't want a vector of booleans. We want a vector of strings. And you do, you signify that with this notation with the greater than less than sign. It may look a little strange, but this is what it is. That's a template in C++, and that's what the standard template library works with. They're containers. A vector is one type of container. It holds things. And what does it hold? It holds strings. So you tell it what it holds inside that, inside these, um, inside these little uh, greater than less than signs. So this is getting close to something that will compile. Um, let's hold off on the printing because we haven't quite figured out the printing yet, accessing this thing. So let's see if that code will compile. Back in the execution window, we can try to compile it and we get an error because we have not told the compiler what a vector is. We need to include, just like for string, the header file that defines what a vector is from the STL. So once we do that, we should be able to compile it and it runs okay. It doesn't do anything yet. And that's gonna be your first challenge. So here you go for a challenge. There is a function in vector, which you can find on that web page, that is called size, that tells you how many entries are in the vector. Write a piece of code that will print the size, which is the number of strings in the vector, um, to the screen. Now that's going to be the same as the number of rows in the grid, right? So our grid, our crossword grid has rows and columns, and the rows is the, is the size of the grid variable. So give that a try. Okay, I hope you had some success. Let's look at what that code should look like. It looks like something like this. The size of the grid is, and we're going to say grid size. It's just that easy. Just like we did for the string. Now string, it's length. Um, STL uh, string provides both the size and the length calls that are the same but for a vector, it's size. So let's run that, and I'll show you what that does. So the size of the grid is seven because we've added seven lines. So just like string offer different functions, vector offers different functions to access the vector. 
and we can go to the browser window here and show you some of those. So here's the vector page and we scroll down to um, element access. The ones that might be interesting for us right now be front and back and then this operator square bracket, just like the string that lets you get at any member of the set of items. So let's try front first. So here we go. So we're gonna say print uh, the first line is, and then we're going to put in grid front. We have to call the function with the empty parentheses. And then we're gonna terminate it with the new line. And we go compile that. And we'll see what it says. And it says the first line is dog dot 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 dot, which is what we told it. So that works great. Let's also just for completeness try the, the, the last line is going to be the thing they call back. So in the train analogy, the front is like the front of the train. The back is the back. With a vector, you can push something onto the back. You can always add another car to the end of the train. But with a vector, it's a simple class. It's very fast, but simple. You cannot add something to the front. It's attached to the engine. Um, but if you print the front and back, it looks like this. So the first line is dog, last line's cat. So here is going to be your next challenge. And you're gonna look at that operator square bracket for the hint, write the code that will print the entire grid. Okay, go. So welcome back. I hope you were able to run that code. Let's show you what that might look like. You would say C out gets grid zero. Oops, let's not forget the terminator. Three, four, five, six, seven. So this is what the code would look like in a simple way to print all the lines of the grid. So there it is. There's the grid that we defined. Now, as you can imagine, there's a better way to do this. This is a pain to have to do each one. And we're going to do, talk about two different ways to do this. The first one is a for loop that works over the collection like this. So we say for, that's a new type of statement. And now we give it a, a variable string, let's call it S, we can call it whatever we want. And this colon says we're going to work over this set of things called a grid. So whatever's in grid, we're going to do the things we put in here uh, are going to be done once for each element of the grid. Um, this statement lets you operate on every element of this set. And it's a general kind of statement. So any container that holds multiple things, you can put in a for statement like this and it will iterate and do the operations inside these braces uh, for every element. Now we're not gonna take grid zero anymore. We're gonna take, what's it gonna be called? It's gonna be called S. So during this, each iteration of that loop inside, it's gonna replace S as like a little placeholder for that element of the grid for that iteration. So this should produce the same thing as we just had. So let's see if that works. And it does. Okay, so that's the first way to do it. And that's a way that's most commonly used and you'll use, your code will have a lot of these. <clears throat> in the code for this course, we have to iterate over both the rows of a grid and the columns. So you'll see a lot of iterations like this where you're gonna be going over those, those elements one by one and then performing operations on them. Um, there's another type of for loop that we should talk about, which is a counting for loop, but it's slightly different syntax. It starts like this. It says for an integer i, and let's start it at zero, and then there's a semicolon, until i is less than seven is the size of this grid. And then you want to, every time, what do you want to do with i? You want to say i equals i plus one. Okay, there's a couple things wrong with this that we'll fix. Uh, first of all, let's get the guts right. So we're gonna say for every one of these things in the grid, we, we don't have an S anymore. There's no automatic S. We have to go back now and we have to put in what? Grid number I, right? So we're gonna take the I element, the ith element of the grid. Um, so what's wrong with this? Uh, this actually will run, but uh, usually you don't wanna hard code the size of something. You want to instead say grid size in here. Uh, that way, if you were to add 
or subtract any elements from the grid up here, it would still run without overflowing the sides of the grid. And the other is that um, this pattern happens so often in C++, this i equals i plus one, that there's a special notation for it, which is i plus plus. So you can take any variable and you can add to it, add one to it like that, plus plus. Um, and it, so that pattern there, you'll see also, you'll see an awful lot. Um, and um, so the for loop and the counting for loop case, you've got three parts to it. The first is the initialization condition. So it's an integer i, starts with zero. Uh, it's the second thing is the termination condition. You're gonna run that loop until i uh, becomes not any longer less than grid size, which means you know more than grid size. And then every time through the loop, you're going to add one to i. So if we run that, it should give the same result. So let's just double check that. Um, and it does, it prints the grid. Um, now, we have a challenge for you. In this challenge, I want you to write out code that will show the number of rows and columns in the grid. Um, give that a try. Okay, welcome back. Let's see what you did for that. Here's one way to do it. Int rows, now the rows of the grid, we already mentioned this, is the same as the grid size. Now the columns of the grid, um, how many are this way? They're actually, it's actually the length of this string, right? But which one? Let's maybe just take the first one. So grid zero size, or could be length. For a string, it's the same. So now we can say rows equals rows and columns equals columns. So let's show what this does. And there you get seven and seven. But let's say we added another row. Let's say in the middle we had th three rows like this. Let's see what that shows. So now there's nine rows and seven columns. And there's another case that this code doesn't really handle very well. What if, let's go back to our regular seven by seven grid. What if there was an extra character here, like some extra characters there to make that too long by mistake? This code won't detect that, right? So if we look at what happens there, you're going to see the same answer seven by seven. We'd like to catch that case. It's really good in coding to write a lot of code that checks that the data are what you want because it will help debugging if you find that early rather than later. So probably if you initialize the grid this way with the wrong length on that one line, you would have some error later and it might be hard to trace it back. But if you have a code that checks it and tells you right away, this is wrong because this reason, you can fix things um, much more at the root cause. So let's think about how to do that. And I'm gonna introduce the last concept for this module is a concept called assert. And it's something that checks if something is true. What we're gonna do is we're gonna say assert. Now we're gonna say grid one, the next line, grid one size. And what do we wanna have it be equal to? An equal, double equals is an equality checker as opposed to an assignment. It just says, does this equal the other side? we're gonna say that equals calls. Okay, so let's try to look at this. This assert statement will pass with no action if this is true, which means the grid, the, 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 the next, the, the one or the second line in the grid is the same length as the first line. Um, and then you can repeat that. But now that we're smart about for loops, we don't need to repeat that. So that's gonna be the next challenge for you is to write the for loop that will check that the every line has the same size as every other line. So give that a try and see if you can get that to work and see if you can put an error in and have it detect the error like we have here. Okay, welcome back. Let's see how you did on that one. There are a couple ways to do it. The simple way would be to use the iteration like this for string s in grid, right? And what are we gonna do? We're gonna put one of these asserts in there, okay? And we're gonna say 
that the size equals calls. So look at that code a minute. It's saying for every string in the grid, does its size match the size of the first one? Now it's gonna run seven times. The first time it runs, it's gonna actually compare the size of the first line with the size of the first line. So it's always gonna pass, but that's okay. It's not worth coding that as a special exception. It's worth, you can just have, it'll just compare all seven. But if any one of them fails, um, then it'll flag it. So let's try to run that and see if it compiles and runs. So the problem here is that it doesn't know what assert is. We haven't told it what assert is. Um, and assert is um, a bit of an old fashioned macro. There's other ways to do that now too. Um, but let's go to the web browser and we'll see what include file we need for assert. <clears throat> we just say what include file do I need for C++ assert, okay? And it will tell you pretty quick right away here um, that you need uh, assert.h. The dot .h is because it's an older style file. So we're gonna say include assert.h and then compile again and it runs, but now it fails. It fails, first of all, it fails at line 21. Let's see what line 21 is. So that is our assert line, which is which is what we expected. And then it fails by just telling us that this condition failed. It didn't tell us which string it failed for, but we can look back and we can see, ah, it's probably this one. So let's just try to fix it and then see if it will run with that fix. Um, and it does. So that's one way to do it. Just for completeness, let me show you the other way with the other style of for loop. You can also say for int i equals zero, um, or you can make this one if if you wanted um, to cut, to not compare the first case, and then i less than grid size, and then i plus plus, oops, i, okay. But now we can't say s anymore, right? There's no s, so what do we say? We have to say grid, what? Not grid zero, but grid i. We want grid i to be checked against calls, which is the, which is the, first size. So we're comparing every other line with the first line, and that's good enough that they'll have to verify that they all have the same value. So let's run that just to show the end, and it passes. So that's it. So the last note about this code in this class is that as you start to learn about object-oriented programming, you'll get a little spidey sense when you see code like this that wants to put this code somewhere you don't like to see code that's hanging out like this, doing things on a grid that isn't collected somewhere. And in C++, where you collect that is in a grid object. So in the next module, we're gonna talk about how you define a data type called grid that will start to collect a lot of these kind of functions like verify that the grid's a square, verify that all the characters are legal, those type of functions belong with the grid. And that's a better way to organize your code than to be writing code you know, in a main function like this that's doing various grid checks. So that's the topic for the next module. So we'll see you there.